All right, good evening. What I wanted to talk about tonight is chapter three of the book. That's about global orbit structure, and it talks about a theorem. So I'm going to give you an idea of what this theorem is about, what it says. Then I think next time we'll talk about more computationally related things, like how to find stable and unstable manifold periodic orbits that are related to what I'm going to talk about with this theorem of global orbit structure. So this all kind of follows from what we were working on in the past few weeks, mostly in that chapter two about the dynamics around Lagrange points, especially L1 and L2. I have a video that one of my students made, uh, Matt Werner. He made this really cool video. So this is showing, let me make it bigger. It's a loop. This is showing the energy cases. So it's showing that effective potential energy surface. And as they, as you set the value of the energy, it's as if you're setting a height along this mountain range. And it's also showing on the right that intersection because those are the zero velocity curves. So pretty cool. Uh, looks looks pretty smooth, at least on my screen. I don't know what you're seeing. It's pretty neat. And we are looking tonight at case three. So case three, this is case one, and then case two, and then this is case three. And it won't, it won't pause, so can't pause it. And everything that we're doing is in, uh, for this theorem at least, is in case three. I'll first give sort of the loose definition of what this theorem says, and then there's a, a more careful way to put it. So this is showing case three for the situation of the Earth-Moon system. And when we're in case three, that means that next have opened up around L1 and L2, and we've said uh, something about there's these equilibrium regions. So I'm saying R, I is this is the the equilibrium region around the point the Lagrange point L I so there's R one and R two and if we're in the Earth Moon system and just looking at the planar case there's going to be a periodic orbit the Lyapunov orbit a single Lyapunov orbit for a given energy in each of these. And if you were to look at something that's winding onto or off of the Lyapunov orbits, we could do that. That's sort of behind the scenes what makes this theorem work. Let me tell you just what the theorem is. You could write down um, a sequence of E, M, and X. And so let me just say that. Pick a sequence of the letters E, M, and X. Uh, but E and X can't be next to each other. So any sequence you could write. So let me say E, M, X, M, X, et cetera. Any sequence of those letters with the rule that E and X can't be next to each other, there exists a trajectory. Remember, we're talking about with no power. There exists some trajectory if we could find the initial conditions, and we do have a way of finding them. There exists a trajectory whose itinerary, itinerary, right, where it is, or whose whereabouts match that sequence. So in this particular case, this would be something where uh, something is in the Earth region, so maybe it's orbiting around the Earth, and then it goes to the Moon region, maybe orbits around the Moon. And then it goes to the exterior region, goes around there, and then maybe comes back, orbits the moon some more, leaves, goes to the exterior region again, and so on. You can make this as long as you want. I've just shown 
sort of a central block here that's five, uh, five letters. But whatever sequence you write, there is some trajectory that exists that matches that, and we can find that. This is a, an informal notation. There's a more formal notation uh, that's, that really describes what's going on here. Um, and it's not just as simple as writing the letters that correspond to these main realms. Um, remember, we had the Earth realm, and we're representing that by E. The M means region around the moon, and then X is this exterior. And the boundaries are these equilibrium regions between them. So that's the, that's the informal version of the theorem of global orbit structure. It sounds a bit grandiose to call it global orbit structure. So remember, this is global in the sense of mathematical global means uh, including you know, something large, not, a, not an infinitesimal neighborhood, but something bigger than that. In this case, it can span the entirety of the phase space. So that's the, that's the informal version of the theorem. And it's not like other theorems because it is, it's constructive in the sense that we can actually find trajectories. We, we provide a computational way to find them. And that's what actually led to the theorem is we uh, found some things computationally and a group of us went around um, and proved it. It's a lot to prove it. We're not gonna go through the proof, but I did wanna talk about this. Are there any are there any questions about this this informal version of it, Doctor Ross? Does the sequence of letters mean like so E M X or it starts at E and then goes to M and then X? Yeah, yeah. And right, and that's just I'm just sort of highlighting this sort of central thing. So we don't know what happens before it was an E. I guess you could think of it as we have something that starts. The theorem itself doesn't really uh, it can actually be infinite on both ends, but yeah, you could have something that actually starts. So you found an initial condition that's in the E uh, realm, and then it'll just naturally go to the M realm and then X and, and so on. So any sequence, or we would say any uh, permissible sequence, in this case, permissible means E and X can't be next to each other. So yeah. All right, so let's, let's talk about some building blocks of this theorem. I think one of the main things is, um, and usually I'll be using not the earth and moon system, but the sun and Jupiter system, because that's, that's what most of my images are based on because we were thinking of describing how comets move and itineraries that describe comets. So if I show the same figure from above, but instead it's you know, the Sun Jupiter system. Okay, so there's Sun and Jupiter system. And if we were to look at just one of these regions, let's say the region around L2, and then just look at it, what do we get? I'm trying to insert. So if you remember from the last like few times that we've met, we said that if you're in this case three or a bottleneck opens up around L1 or L2, for both of them, you have a similar type of picture to what I'm showing here, which is that we've got, I'm showing as B, B means bound orbits. In the planar case, this is just a single periodic orbit, but and an analogous picture actually holds in the three degree of freedom problem. And instead of it being just one periodic orbit, there's actually a, a continuum of bound orbits, periodic and quasi-periodic. And then A are those that are winding onto and off of it, or the asymptotic orbits. So that means they go to the, I'll say periodic orbit the one that's in this region, they go to the periodic orbit as T goes to plus or minus infinity. 
we've shown here something that's winding onto it, meaning it's it, it never quite gets to the periodic orbit. It's just always getting closer and closer. It's asymptoting to it as time goes to infinity. And those asymptotic orbits, we've said, form some kind of boundary that looks like a, a tube. It's tube-like. And inside the tube, so inside the region bounded by uh, these asymptotic orbits, we have the transit orbits. The transit orbits, they go from uh, one side of the equilibrium region to the other. And they're all inside a tube. The things that are outside the tube are the non-transit orbits. And I've labeled those NT. So non-transit means they, they enter from one side and return to that same side. And it's not as kind of clean cut and pretty as the picture shown here. You could have a non-transit orbit. I'll sketch something uh, that's, it could come in here and maybe even go around this Lagrange point a few times. But if it returns to that same side, in this case, the right side, that's a non-transit. Similarly, the transit orbits don't just do something like this. If I have a nearby transit orbit, say I'm starting up here on the right side, it might actually go around L2 a few times and then leave. And this is going to become important in the careful writing of, of the theorem. The theorem not only says uh, which realm, in this case, would be uh, like a listing of S, J, and X. You could also specify how many times something goes around a Lagrange point. So does it go around three times? You know, how many circuits? But that's in the, the more careful part. That's the local picture. These are sort of the building blocks. Another kind of interesting picture to show would be, I guess it would be this one. This sort of gives an idea, it's a schematic of what a the, the equilibrium region looks like up in the energy surface. It is just a cartoon. This cartoon wasn't made by me. This was, I got this from a chemistry paper where they have some kind of similar phenomenon. But this is showing, I mean, it looks like we have two different tubes because it's just, it's very hard to depict what's happening in the equilibrium region itself. So this is some artist license was taken here, but this does show there's the idea of uh, there are the, the transit orbits going from one side to the other. So from left to right or up here on the top. And then there's transit orbits in the inside here going from right to left of some kind of bottleneck region. It's both a bottleneck and then we've also called it an equilibrium region. And this is all in the energy surface. So you've chosen some fixed energy trajectories in the three body problem conserve energy so they don't change energy so you can move anywhere in this three-dimensional two-lobed thing this looks like a an hourglass on its side and you could imagine this is uh you know the region around the earth and then the region around the moon if you want or if we're using the case of sun and jupiter then sun sun region jupiter region computationally the way that we can connect up things that are transiting from one side to the others. We look on what's called a Poincaré section. So this, we're showing a slice here, a Poincaré section. And I think uh, the, uh, the Poincaré section deserves a little bit more discussion. So let me say something about that. Um, but I mean, one of the main things here is that on this Poincaré section, if I were to sort of schematically draw it, we've got, this is the whole sort of boundary of that section. And then we'd have a tube. Let's call this maybe tube one. And then down here, so this is the intersection of tube one. And then down here is tube two. And that tube two, you notice there's some kind of overlap they do have some region where they intersect. So if you're in, if you have an initial condition that's in there, 
And that means something that if you take it forward in time, it follows that path. And if you take it backward in time, it follows that path. So this would be something that kind of comes into this region on the right and then goes through. And who knows what it's doing over here, in the unseen parts. The idea of a Poincaré section, it goes back to Poincaré, who he wrote a lot about the three-body problem. He had, uh, I think it was a three-volume set called New Methods in Celestial Mechanics. And even though he didn't have a computer, he could kind of foresee all the computational stuff that we did. Uh, we've been doing hundreds of years, uh, over a hundred years later. A Poincaré section. This is, we're looking in an N degree of freedom system. So that's the setting. You've got a, the, the energy, well, let me say, if you have an N degree of freedom system, mechanical system, that means you have a 2N dimensional phase space. So if we're thinking that we're looking at a N equals two degree of freedom, then we have a four dimensional phase space. The energy surface is 2N minus one. So we have a 2N minus one dimensional energy surface, or sometimes people call it an energy manifold. Chemists will call it an energy shell. It just means uh, to can, for the energy to remain constant, you are stuck on something that is one dimension less than the full phase space. And usually they, they're, they're, they're nested one inside the other, just like the Russian dolls. A Poincaré section is another surface where you're taking a slice of this 2n minus one dimensional energy surface. So I'll say a Poincaré section, this would be a 2n minus two dimensional slice of the energy surface. Usually you write that as sigma. So that's what is meant by a Poincaré section. Other terms are Poincaré surface of section, or um, what's another one? Poincaré return map. But this, this is a good illustration up here. So we might refer to this surface, say, as uh, sigma. Sigma is one way it's referred to. I, I, I don't know why. I'll probably use something else because in our notation, we used something else. So a Poincaré section becomes a way to look at trajectories in phase space by taking a slice of them. Let me move this over here. We will uh, seek initial conditions on appropriately chosen Poincaré sections. In some systems, you can get away with just looking at one Poincaré section. We'll look at four Poincaré sections. Partly because which Poincaré sections get hit uh, is, is part of the theorem. So I'm gonna define four Poincaré sections I won't call them capital sigma. We actually chose the U. So I'm gonna write something here. This is a line. I'm gonna call this U1. So U1 is going to correspond to X equals, no, it's not X equal, it's Y equals zero. So it's, it's the X axis or Y equals zero, X say less than, zero greater than negative one. And U2 will be over here, right under Jupiter. So U2 is gonna be defined by X equals one minus mu and um, Y less than zero, but in the J realm. So this is U2. U3, maybe I'll label it over here, U3. This is X equals one minus mu, Y greater than zero in the J realm. So up here, this U1, I guess I could say this is in the S realm. U4 
will be in the exterior realm. And we'll just put it there. So U4 is also y equals zero, but now it's x is less than negative one in the S realm. These are four Poincaré sections. And uh, when I say let's seek initial conditions, maybe I should put it uh, more concretely. We'll, we'll choose a specific example. Let's say we seek a region in any of the Poincaré sections corresponding to an itinerary. And I'll write it this way, X, J, S. So something that's coming from the X region goes through this J region and then is in the S region. If I follow this backward further, and you know, I'll probably hit there. So this would be something that say started on U4, hit U3, and then goes to U1. So I could look on any of these Poincare sections for a region that corresponds to this itinerary. I'm going to look at U3, but I don't I don't have to. Um, if we look at how all of these things are connected. Uh, you could see well where we'll be looking. So I'm going to switch now to looking at um, a PDF that I have. There it is. So these are the Poincaré sections. And if we now just schematically show how uh, the asymptotic trajectories are connected to the L1 and L2 periodic orbits or L1 and L2 Lyapunov orbits. Uh, you could see at least here on the left, kind of the global thing, what's happening. And we've labeled things red if they're uh, asymptotic in backward time. So that's called an, an unstable manifold. Green if they're asymptotic in forward time. So that means they're going to one of these Lyapunov orbits in forward time. And then we stopped thing, we stopped the computation when they hit one of these Poincare sections. So it's not that things just end. We're just stopping the computation there. And I'm labeling them in a certain way. So for example, T bracket X J is highlight it. There it is. So it's this green tube. This is the solid tube of trajectories. So think of the asymptotic trajectories form the boundary. What's inside are all transit trajectories. So I call that a solid tube. These are the trajectories that are currently in the X realm. That's why we put a bracket around it. And they're heading to the J realm. And then uh, it also intersects this U4 Poincaré section. And if we were to zoom in, let's say on the region around Jupiter, we've got these things labeled in a consistent way to that other one. So if you look at this one right here, it's this TXJ. This is the solid tube of trajectories that came from the X region and is currently in the J region. So this is how we label X. It first came from X and now it's currently in the J uh, realm. And in fact, everything that's inside here in the energy surface, we're just showing a phase-based projection. In the energy surface, it will have come from this green region as well. So it came from there. So everything in here will go through and then get through there. All right, so all of these are, are labeled in a particular way. If I wanna find something that has that itinerary X, J, S. I have my pick of, well, which realm do I want to look in? I'm going to look in the J realm. So that's why I get this thing here. That's why it's bracket J. So I want to find a region that uh, has X, J, S, which means if I'm in, it's in the J region. So if I were to integrate it forward, it's going to go to the S uh, region. If I integrate it backward, it's going to go to the X region. And by looking at 
what I have here. I have TXJ and then TJS. Those intersect along this U3 Poincaré section. So I'm going to look at what's happening in that Poincaré section. And this is what's happening. Um, so I've isolated now just those two, the TXJ and the TJS, and I'm showing what's happening on that Poincaré section U3. This was defined, remember, this is the X direction, and then this other direction is the Y direction. So what I'm plotting here is Y as the um, along this horizontal axis, and then Y dot, which is a phase space direction, another phase space direction along that vertical direction. The red tube, when it, it intersects U3, it forms a boundary. The green tube, if you follow where it intersects here, it forms this boundary. And so anything that's inside the green and red, just based on what we know these these tubes where they came from, we could label everything in this green region JS because it's currently any initial condition in here is currently in the J realm. If we follow it forward in time, say so here's so here's if I follow it forward in time, it's going to go to the S realm. Everything in this uh, XJ where J has the bracket around it, it's currently in the J realm, and if I follow it backward it will uh, go to the X realm, meaning going forward, it's starting in X and going into J. And they do intersect. They seem to intersect, if you were to look at just the figure down here, it looks like, well, they intersect everywhere, but that's just them intersecting in position, not intersecting in velocity. If you want something that intersects in position and velocity, then you have to focus on this intersection region right there. And that's been colored uh, a different color. That's kind of brownish. So some a point like that one is exactly where if it goes forward, it'll go to the S realm. If you follow it backward, it'll go to the X realm. So that's what we're looking for. Uh, you might be wondering, well, that's just giving us the, the Y dot velocity. I can understand, okay, we're sort of specifying all of these initial conditions. We've got X just from the Poincaré section. We're picking Y and Y dot based on where we are in this Poincaré section. What about X dot? Well, X dot comes from the energy because of the energy equation, X, Y, X dot, Y dot equals something, equals some constant. You can solve this. You can solve for X dot. So the energy constraint makes it so that all we have to do is look at these two dimensional Poincaré sections. And so that makes it easy to visually interpret. If we want to think of this in terms of the, those McGehee bounding spheres that were boundaries for the equilibrium regions, well, the, the bounding sphere, let's just focus on the right one here. The bounding sphere that's on the, uh, um, I guess you'd call it the left boundary of the L2 equilibrium region. It has a spherical cap of transit orbits, and I'm coloring it in red here. If you were to follow that spherical cap forward in time, it deforms and it becomes this thing on the Poincaré section, which still has the, the topology of a disk, right? If you have a, a disk, could be a look exactly circular, or you could deform it a little bit and still topologically, it is a disc. I'm saying disc, disc means it's the interior of the circle. We usually reserve the term circle for just the boundary. So this is a disc. The bounding sphere over here is a bunch of uh, transit trajectories that are, if we follow that backward, we get this. And the technical words for following forward and following backward are image, and pre-image. This means image means you follow it forward under the dynamics. Pre-image means follow it backward under the dynamics. So really what we have here are the intersections, this region in there, that intersection region, kind of like a Venn diagram. That's the part where these, the pre-image and the image of spherical cap intersect. 
So now zooming in on that region, we have a natural way to label the region and it's XJS. It's the intersection of these two. They have the bracket J in common. So we just call it XJS. So anything in here, any point in there, and remember X dot is given by the energy constraint, any point in there will do what we wanted initially, which is it started in the X realm and it's going to, it's going to go to the J realm and then the S realm. So if I pick an initial condition in there, it started, let's say at this red dot, I follow it backward. It goes to the X realm, I follow it forward, it goes to the S realm. So that initial condition was the X bracket J S. You might be wondering, well, what about these bracket things? What's that all about? So if I follow this forward and then it intersects the Poincaré section I called U1, there's a region in U1, if I were to just sort of sketch U1, it's gonna be some region in U1 that corresponds to its X, J, and then bracket S. So the bracket moves to where you currently are. And back here, if I follow the X and the X realm, followed it backward to U4, then on U4, there's gonna be some region that's labeled uh, bracket X, J, S. So the brackets just sort of follow where it is currently, where the initial condition is. So if we wanted to look at a longer itinerary, right? Every, every initial condition in here is gonna do the same thing. And to me thinking as an engineer, this gives robustness to our, our construction because I'm not just picking a single point, even if I'm off by quite a bit, anything within that region, the whole region is gonna have the same behavior. So this is good. Um, this helps us deal with uncertainties. If you want a longer itinerary though, you get smaller regions of space. So this is now just adding on to the XJS. If we added a trip back to the J realm on both ends, well, that shrinks up the set of initial conditions tremendously. It's this tiny little rectangle right there. If I were to sort of expand that out, it's just a tiny rectangle. And Everything in there has that itinerary of J, X, J, S, J. And of course, since I'm starting in the J realm, this thing, if I follow it backward and forward, it will do all these things. And so that's, I forget where the initial condition is. Yeah, it's right here. This is the initial condition that I'm following forward and backward. Backward is in dashed, forward is in solid. And so this has that itinerary. Actually, this is a different itinerary. Sorry about that. This is a, a different itinerary. This is the one that is close to what that comet Oterma did. So I did a different construction for this where I must have constructed it in the S realm. So I looked at it some intersection on U4, sorry, U1, and uh, found a region that had X, J, S, J, X. What it requires is you keep following these tubes for more and more intersections and they get windy and it's just, it's a computational issue, but it can be done. This can also be done in three degrees of freedom. It's just harder to visualize because there the tubes aren't cylinders. You might call them hyper cylinders. A cylinder is something like, I've got a cardboard tube right here, right? It's, a, it's just a tube. And mathematically, we refer to these things as S1 cross R, right? But S1 meaning the circle. It's the circle in one direction and then the other direction is just the real line. Well, now you just have to imagine instead of a circle, what if we had a three-dimensional sphere? Yeah, good luck with that. Three-dimensional sphere cross R. And then when you slice that, you get a Poincaré section of that. Uh, it looks like just a three-sphere. So just like with these things, 
but we're taking the intersection and the intersection looks like a circle, boundary of a circle. Now going forward, when you take a Poincare section of the S3 cross tire, you get a, a three sphere. And how do we view this three sphere? This three sphere projects to a disc across a disc. So if we say picked a point in, I'll call this, this is Z and the Z dot directions. And then this is Y and Y dot. Every point in Z and Z dot corresponds to a circle in the Y and Y dot projection. If I chose a different point, I'd have a different circle. So I could look for tubes this way. This is something that we did numerically. And uh, we found intersections. You could find intersections of two different tubes and still get an XJS orbit. So we picked some point, it's probably hard to see here, but we picked some point in the Z direction where we had two circles that intersected. Uh, they had some region of intersection. And that point is an initial condition corresponding to the itinerary XJS, which then follow that forward and backward. This is probably the initial condition follow it backward, goes to the X realm, this is the J realm, and it's going to the S realm. So you could do this even in even in 3D. You could also have things just sort of show up and then maybe orbit around. And here's a 3D version of that. So that's another example. Plus if the two tubes themselves intersect, you get what are called heteroclinic connections. So th these are trajectories that instead of uh, being transit orbits, they're actually asymptotic to a bound orbit around L1 or L2. So uh, this is one trajectory just seen in, uh, in three or four different views. Let me go back to here and maybe finish up with what this theorem is. So this is the theorem of global orbit structure. This is in section 310 of the book. But this is in, when you're in case three, the Earth-Moon system is nice. So may as well think in terms of it. Let me write U1, U4, what was this, U2? They're over here, U2, and up here, U3. You can write any permissible sequence. And I'm not going to use EM and X. I'm actually going to do it carefully, which is that we'll write, um, if I write U, I not, and then R not. That's the first entry. And then the next entry is U, U, I, one, R one, et cetera. And before that is U, I negative one, R negative one. There is an orbit or trajectory whose whereabouts match this. So there's an orbit or trajectory which starts on the Poincare section. These are all lowercase u's, but there's, there's an orbit or trajectory which starts on the Poincare section capital U uh, I not and goes to Juan Cray section U I one. This is a one. Passing through an equilibrium region, performing are not circuits around the equilibrium point.
and I could just say, et cetera. Meaning the next thing will be, it goes from, from UI1, whatever that Poincaré section is, to the next one and performs R1 circuits around the equilibrium point that's between those two. And if you were to go backward, so this is the way of specifying the initial condition. So if I had something, maybe I should give an example. Let's try an example here. Uh, U3, I'll have it sort of start. So U3, uh, one, and then it goes to U1, uh, two, U2, one, U4, two, what is this? This is something that starts on U3 and between U3 and U1 is the equilibrium point uh, L1. So this will be an initial condition which seems to orbit around here, do one circuit, and then it goes and hits U1. And now between U1 and U2, right, to go from there to there, you again have to go through L1. And this says it'll orbit around L1 two times. So go around there two times, hit U2, and then go to U4. Between U2 and U4, I have to hit, uh, I have to go around L2. And this says um, going around it once. So, and then go to U4. And then we don't know what happens after that, but permissible here takes into account that you can't have something going directly from U1 to U4. It has to hit, um, if you're going to go from U1 to U4, you have to hit U2 first. And you can't go from U4 to U1 without hitting U3 first. So that's what permissible is. And there's a way to make that concrete. Now, some implications of this theorem, because there could be any, any integer could be uh, in place of Ri. You could even have Ri being infinite. You could have things that, um, you could have sequences that terminate, meaning you have something that goes to, it does U2 comma infinity. And from U2, that means it's going to L2 and it's just sort of doing infinite circuits around U2. So included in this are uh, orbits that are asymptotic to some particular uh, periodic orbit, either around L1 or L2. There's also things uh, you could have that in backward time. So it came from something. It also means you could have sequences that are completely periodic. So they seem to be doing the same thing over and over and over. Uh, you could also have chaotic orbits. So there's also, this was something that I would call asymptotic. But you could also have periodic orbits. And that means they could be spanning going all around this Earth Moon system. They're periodic orbits of all periods exist because of this theorem. There's also chaotic orbits. Chaotic orbits means it's non periodic. So there's actually an infinity of these, infinity of non periodic uh, orbits. So it has some interesting implications. I think one of the most, and it's this is a phenomenon that one sees in deterministic chaos, right? There's there's equations of motion here, and it was kind of startling when people like Poincaré first realized that even in deterministic equations you could have chaos, meaning small changes in initial conditions can grow exponentially. So things might seem to randomly jump and stuff but it's not it's not random deterministic chaos maybe i'll just put that term here deterministic chaos does not mean random it actually means there is a lot of structure in fact so much structure 
that things get very complicated, but it isn't, it is not randomness. It's seemingly random, but it's not, right? The weather seems random, but it's governed by the laws of physics. There's deterministic chaos. They can't predict the weather. Well, here around Blacksburg, they can't predict the weather for even a day, but uh, I think even theoretically, we can't get past a week. You know, use all the computational power in the world and you probably couldn't predict the weather for, it depends on what level of fidelity. And this is a pretty simple model. This is just the three body gravitational problem. It's two and a half centuries old. Um, and still there's chaos. So this is a, it's an interesting theorem. We mostly use it in the sense of constructing things. We never actually construct infinite sequences. This is about infinite sequences of these uh, symbols, U1 through U4, and then integers. For any kind of practical thing that we want to work on, uh, we could just use that a constructive approach where if we want something that goes from the Earth to the Moon to the exterior region, and then maybe orbits around L2, we can do that. And there's a, there's a constructive way to do it. So I think that's all I'm going to talk about today. And the next time we'll begin chapter four, which is about constructing trajectories with prescribed itineraries. But there's there's a lot that goes into that. The first thing is finding periodic orbits beyond just the linear approximation. So we'll use something called differential correction. So I think that's what we'll do Wednesdays. So I'll introduce differential correction, which involves the variational equations and the state transition matrix. Maybe we'll even do a, an example calculation because I have some MATLAB code for most of this stuff. We've reached the mountaintop. This is the mountaintop. So some of this, I mean, it's not easy. I'm sure I rushed over some things I shouldn't have. But thanks for joining, and I'll see you Wednesday. If you appreciated this video, please like and subscribe, or just wait and watch the next video in the series.